Hello, my excellent biologists. This is um, an honors bio video, um, but for us, it's chapter 23, Patterns of Gene Inheritance, and this is video number two. So if you need the basics about Mendel and monohybrid and dihybrid crosses in genotype and phenotypes, I encourage you to watch video one. In this particular video, let me make myself a little bit smaller. Um, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna start off by talking about pedigrees, and then we're gonna go beyond Mendel and look at some exceptions to his rules. Let me get this started here. And um, if you are new uh, to my channel here, then in the descriptor of this video, I have a link to the notes I give my students, column one, fill it in. Um, and I'll help you fill that in as we go along. And then column two is empty and I encourage you to put in pictures that are helpful for you. So this is chapter 23 and we're actually in the middle of, if you look at 23.1 Mendel's laws and you kind of go about two thirds of the way down after two trait crosses, it starts out autosomal patterns of inheritance and pedigree. So that's where I am right above 23.2. Okay. So let's get started. The first thing is pedigree is not just a dog food. So when you look at a pedigree, the affected individual will always be colored in and then it's kind of sexist, but the females are circles and the males are squares. This is what's called a marriage line. I know you can make a baby without being married, but they call it a marriage line and then you see the offspring below. What I always do is I start with the affected individual and then I look back at the parents and I look forward at the children if they have any. And then what you're trying to do is predict from a pedigree, whether it's an autosomal trait um, or a sex link trait and whether it's dominant or recessive and I'll help you to be able to do that. For instance, um, and we'll talk about sex link traits just a little bit later in this video. If you look at this, you can see that, um, that these parents produced a child with a trait that neither one of them expressed, right? So it was hidden. So that should be a hint right away that this would be a recessive trait, an autosomal recessive trait. Now, for those of you who already understand sex link traits, I'm just going to give you a little bit of information here. In order for a female to express a sex link trait, her father for sure has to be expressing it because one of her two X chromosomes comes from her dad, right? So both of them would have to be, if it's a sex link recessive trait, both of them would have to be carriers for that, right? Um, and we'll, we'll have more on that later. So the first thing I want you to know is on your autosomal patterns of inheritance, autosomes um, are any chromosome other than a sex chromosome is an autosome. And that's what we're going to be focusing on first. So remember, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and the first 22 are called autosomes. The 23rd pair is a sex chromosome. So any form of inheritance where you for sure have two copies of it, right, would be um, one through 22. The affected individual um, is solid and males and females in autosomal traits are affected equally. So your sex is not a determiner of whether or not you're going to express that trait or not. So let's look through this real quick. So here the female has it. This is a, a sex-linked recessive trait. We don't know the complete genotype of her spouse here. We know it has a, he has at least one big A because he doesn't have the disease. They had two children this daughter and this daughter. Now, neither one of them express that trait, and that's very typical of a recessive trait because it can remain hidden, right? If somebody has brown eyes, they could be a carrier for a blue-eyed trait. You would not know unless they had a blue-eyed child, right? So here um, they had a daughter, and um, here they had a son, and these relatives are mating. Not a good idea for many different reasons, but when you have recessive traits, if you interbreed within your family, you're more likely to combine those recessive traits together, which is exactly what happened here. So on your notes, autosomal patterns of inheritance, first of all, if it's on an autosome, any, um, you want to put in what I have here in the notes next to autosome, any chromosome other than the sex chromosome, and both males and females are affected with equal frequency, with equal frequency. And in the pedigree, females are circles, males are squares, and affected individuals are solid colors. For a recessive, which is the next box, a recessive one, um, 
what you would see in, in the case here, you could be unaffected but have an affected child. But two affected parents will always have affected offspring, right? That's like two blue-eyed people will always have blue-eyed children because they have the recessive trait and both their copies would be recessive. So there are several diseases that are related to that. Tay-Sachs disease is a horrible disease. Children are born normally, but as they develop within their first three to four years, um, they end up having uh, Tay-Sachs or symptoms of it, and that's because they don't have an enzyme that they need um, that helps with fat metabolism in nerve cells. And what happens is it's progressive. progressive. They um, have mental deterioration, blindness, paralysis, seizures, unable, you know, their hair starts to fall out and usually live between um, two to five years. And I have that listed um, underneath one of your examples. Um, another um, autosomal recessive disease is cystic fibrosis. And so on your notes for that, the only part that you need to add in underneath that is um, number three, two affected parents will always have affected children, will always have affected children. Now, if you look at this um, trait, um, is, is it dominant? or is it recessive? If you look at a pedigree like this, do you think it is a dominant or recessive trait? So let's go over what we know, okay? Um, here, this individual has it and this individual has it, but they have a child that doesn't have it. Now, what do we know about recessive traits? If you have two blue-eyed parents, you're gonna have a blue-eyed child, right? Because that's all you have to give. Obviously, they have something else to give if their child escaped this disease. So. Both of these individuals were carrier for a good copy of the gene. So that means what they're expressing is a dominant trait and they were carrying a recessive allele. So that you could think of this as a hybrid, big A, little A, big A, little A. And as long as you have the big A, you're gonna express this dominant trait, but they were carriers for two little A's and they ended up not getting the disease. So this could be typical. Um, of a dominant trait. So this individual right here though, they have escaped it. So any children that they have from here on out, as long as they don't marry somebody who has that dominant trait, will never have this disease. So if you look at this pedigree, two in, this is exactly what we saw there, is that there were two individuals that had it, they were hybrid, but they had a child that did not have it. Here they had another child. And as long as they don't marry anyone with the disease, all of their children will escape it because recessive traits can skip generations, but dominant traits can't. So they had two children that have the disease and here they married somebody who didn't have it. So they, you know they have two good copies of the allele and each child had a 50-50 chance of getting this disease, right? Because this father was hybrid. So they had a 50% chance, 50% chance. And here they both gave the recessive um, copy. So this girl right here escaped it. So for um, Autosomal dominant disordered disorders, affected children will usually have obviously an affected parent. Heterozygotes are affected. Um, two affected parents can produce an unaffected child. Um, so um, what I mean by that is these two affected parents could produce unaffected children as long as they were carriers for a good copy of that gene. And some examples of some autosomal dominant disorders. Oh, first take a look at this, sorry. So this is called hypercholesterolemia, and if you were going to look at this, could you tell that this was an autosomal dominant disorder? Okay. First of all, I know it's autosomal because males and females are affected equally by this. Um, get a pointer. Okay. Um, you have just as many males that are affected by it by, as females, and if you notice on this particular one, if they have the disease, right? Um, they could be carrying a good copy of it and possibly because they had a child that did not have this disease, right? And as long as this child right here marries in somebody who else who doesn't have the disease, then all of their children are free and clear because dominant disorders do not skip generations. You wouldn't expect it to show up here in generation three. If generation two, the two parents don't have it, all their children are golden pony boy. They are not going to get that disease. Whereas recessive diseases can keep popping up. Notice you can see a line. Dad had it, 
dad had it here and has a daughter who has it. So it's continuous here, it's not skipping. They didn't have it, so their offspring don't have it. Okay, um, neurofibromatosis is where you get these tan discoloring patches. Um, and this is an autosomal dominant disorder. So if you have a friend that has one of those, one of their parents has it as well. Um, oftentimes they get these removed because in the sun, these can become tumorous. Um, and so here, this is kind of a brutal slide, but those, those tan spots can become these tumors. Um, from that. So um, another one is Huntington's disease. Super bummer about Huntington's disease is you can be 40 years old before it strikes. So you could be having children and not be aware that you are passing that on to your children. Um, it's a terrible disorder where you're unable to control your body parts. Um, and literally you have to be strapped to a chair or bed in order to stay in it. Otherwise you will have these movements which would make you fall, kind of fall out. So now for this woman to have this, one of her two parents would have, one of her parents would have had to have it as well. But if she doesn't know her parents or her parents didn't survive, then she would not be aware that she is a carrier or she has that gene, the Huntington's disease, and that can be tested for. So um, here's another one, achondroplasia, the most common form of dwarfism. This is an autosomal dominant trait. So if these two marry, is there a chance that they could have a child that does not have achondroplasia? Uh, achondroplasia. And it is, if they're hybrids for it, then yes, they could have a normal height child um, as a result if they, if they have a good copy. Now, I know they would have a good copy, and this is why. If you are homozygous for this gene, dominant, dominant, then you do not develop in that. Um, you would have, that you would be you would not survive development. So anybody who survives it, it does, has care, has a, is carrying a good copy of that gene. Okay, so those are all listed for you as examples. All right, so that is our, we're gonna revisit pedigrees once I teach you about sex-linked inheritance. So is the next pedigree an example of a dominant trait or a recessive trait? And what is the genotype of number eight? So you might wanna pause the video for a minute. Do you think this is typical of an autosomal dominant or an autosomal recessive trait? And what is the genotype of individual eights? You might wanna pause. Okay, so first of all, I wanna tell you, I know it's autosomal and not sex linked because males and females are affected equally. I believe it is an autosomal dominant trait and that's because it doesn't skip generations. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't go away and then pop back up again. So it's gonna be an autosomal dominant trait. What is the genotype of individual eight? Well, because I look back at her parents, her mother was obviously then homozygous recessive, let's say little a, little a. And um, I know that her dad right here is also a heterozygote because grandma up here was not a carrier of it. So I know she is a heterozygote. She got one good copy from mom and then she got a bad copy of the gene from dad. All right. Hopefully that is helpful for you. And now let's move beyond dominant um, and recessive alleles and their form of inheritance. And let's look at two, some exceptions to the rules. So this is 23.2. So the first thing I need to talk to you about is blood type. You know the different phenotypes. You could be A, B, A, B, O, A, B, and O. Um, you also know about positive, negative, um, the RH factor. Put a pin in that, I'll come back to that later. So how do you get these four different phenotypes? Whereas when we were looking at pea plants, you were either a tall pea plant or a short pea plant. Here you have A, B, A, B, and O. And the reason is because you have multiple alleles to choose from for your trait. Now you still have big I and little I, but you have big I superscript A and big I superscript B. So you still have dominance. Big I is dominant over little I. But what kind of combinations in the genotype do you think would give you type A blood? I'll let you pause there if you want to. But type A blood, you have two ways to get that, either homozygous A or heterozygote A. So two copies of the big I A allele, or you're a hybrid, big I A over little i. The same thing applies for type B. Here, type AB blood, you get two dominant alleles. This also looks shows you another exception to the rule, which is called codominance. Both the 
the A allele is expressed and the B allele is expressed. And that is called codominance, and we'll talk about that. And then type O blood is little i, little i. So you do not generate um, either the A antigen or the B antigen. Okay, so here I've kind of charted it out for you, phenotypes and genotypes, and try this practice problem. Cross a heterozygote A person, heterozygote A, with a heterozygote B, and what are the possibilities of their children's genotypes and phenotypes? So you might wanna pause and try that. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. What's the setup for that? A heterozygote A would be big I, A, little i, heterozygote B, and then these would be the possible zygotes, right, in your Punnett square, so try it, pause if you need to, because I'm going forward, all right? So these are the different genotypes that you would get from that cross. It doesn't mean you have to have four children, but this is just giving you the stats on what you could predict in your offspring, right? This individual's genotype would be big IA, big IB, um, and this would be AB blood as a phenotype. This would be B blood, this would be A blood, and this would be type O blood. And at the end of this presentation, if you're watching this on YouTube, I have a bunch of practice problems. If you go to the link for the group shared notes, it has a link to this presentation and these slides, and all the practice problems are there at the end. All right, um, so I think I need to give you some notes on that before I start in on that. Let me go back a little bit. So multiple allele, allele traits. Um, the definition is defined is when a uh, gene has many allelic forms or alternative expressions instead of just two. So instead of just big T and little t, we have big I A, big I B and little i, right? Um, and I gave you those. Codominance is when both dominant allele possibilities, when both dominant allele possibilities are expressed, which can happen in AB blood. All right, so now let's look at incomplete dominance. And this is not true of all flowers, but this is when you could have this red flower, which is R1, R1, and this white flower, R2, R2. When you have that, it's not that you get um, all red or all white, but you get what looks like an intermediate color, um, and that would be the hybrid, R1, R2. What would happen if you cross two of these pink flowers? Well, you'll start to see the possibilities one and four, right, of getting the R1, R1 combination for red and one and four for the white flower and 50% for more pink flowers. So on your definition for incomplete dominance, when a heterozygote has intermediate, has an intermediate phenotype between that of either homozygote. When a heterozygote has an intermediate phenotype between that of either homozygote. Examples in plants, red flower crossed with the white flower gives pink flowers. All right, I think I gave you another, maybe, yes. Okay, so again, here is an example of incomplete dominance. A person with straight hair, uh, their genotype is H1, H1. I can remember that easily because ones are very straight. Um, a person with naturally curly hair is H2, H2. Twos are curly. So. What would happen um, if you crossed, if you had an H1, uh, a straight haired person crossed with a curly haired person, um, all their offspring would have wavy hair, which would be a result of the H1, H2 genotype. So then cross for me two wavy haired individuals. You can pause if you want to, and I will show you that cross. So two wavy haired individuals, what would that show up to be? You would have one child with straight, two uh, out of four would have wavy, and one out of four would have curly hair. Okay, so that is incomplete dominance. Now, um, let's go, um, another exception to the rule um, is when you look at sex-linked inheritance. And we just wanna remind ourselves that our 23rd pair, if you are female, biological female, are two X chromosomes. So you have two copies, just like all your other chromosomes, right? Homologous pair one, homologous pair two, homologous pair three, consists of one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad, but both of yours are X chromosomes. However, to be a biological male, your 23rd pair, um, one chromosome from mom would be the X and the chromosome you got from your dad is a Y. And these two chromosomes do not have the same genes on them. And in that way, they are not homologs. They have different genes which code for different traits. So if you are a boy, you have one shot at your X chromosome and that's whichever one of the X chromosomes your mom gave you. You have one shot at your X and you have one shot at your Y. So when you do a Punnett square, 
right? When you have a female, right, you, you take her two possibilities, X and X, you take the male's two possibilities, you, and you combine, you have a 50-50 chance of getting a girl or a boy. But the females have two versions of the X, the one they receive from mom and the one they receive from dad. So when you look at these types of traits, you're going to put the traits on the X chromosome. Now, there are traits unique to the Y chromosome. We're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about those. Those are called holandric traits. Things like having a hairy pinna, where if you look at your dad or your grandpa and they've got hair all over their pinna right there, that's a, a trait that only, um, gets transferred on the Y chromosome. Since I'm two X chromosomes, I'm never going to have a hairy pinna. All right. So on your X link traits, you have literally all the notes for that. So just follow along with me um, as I explain some examples. So one of those is color blindness, and there are different kinds of color blindness. But with the sex link color blindness, remember. If you're a female, you'll have two shots at getting a good copy of the X chromosome. Now, what bothers me is that they use the letter B to indicate normal vision and we're thinking colorblind. Like, that's not a dominant trait. All of the, um, at least for my class, um, I will always give you, your sex link traits will always be recessive. So for a female to be colorblind, she needs to get two little Bs for her to be colorblind. A male, he only has one shot at his ex, so if his mom gives him that bad ex, then he is going to be colorblind. He will never be a carrier. He either has it or he doesn't have it. His mom gave him a good ex or his mom gave him a bad ex. Now, females can be carriers, just like with any recessive trait. A female could have normal color vision, but she could be carrying that colorblind um, allele as well. So let's look at um, this. Try this cross for me. Cross a normal vision man with a woman who is a carrier. So she's heterozygote for colorblindness. Normal vision man. And here, let me give you this to help you. A normal vision man with a woman who is a carrier. Okay, set up that Punnett square. All right. And pause if you need to work it out. What's going to happen to those children? Okay, so this is a woman who is a carrier. X big B, X little b with a normal colored male. By the way, if you're colorblind, you're gonna have a hard time seeing what number is amongst these dots. And I will tell you, try to figure that out. And the number is 45. And you would be able to clearly see that if you are not colorblind. Um, so let's look at the outcome of this cross. Okay, this would be a normal female. This would be a carrier female. This would be a normal male, and this would be a colorblind male. All right, so what are some um, hallmarks if you're looking at a pedigree for sex link disorders? First of all, um, you're gonna see it more predominantly, these disorders in males than females, because they only have to get one version of it to get it, whereas females need two copies. So statistically speaking, males are more likely to get it than females. Some other hallmarks you would look for in a pedigree is that in order for a female to get a sex link trait, her, fa her father has to have it and her mother has to at least be a, um, um, a carrier for it. Oh, th these are not her parents, by the way. This is this boy's parents right here. So this girl right here, her father has to have the disease and her mother has to be a carrier. We're not seeing her parents over here. Um, also, because it is a recessive trait, it can skip generations. It can skip generations. All right. So um, looking here, this is a good example of a um, pedigree of a sex link traits. What would I look for? Well, males have it more than females. Check. Um, it's skipping generations. It's recessive. Um, and so I don't have any females that would have it. If a female had it, her father would definitely have to have it. All right, so one example of these is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So for these three boys to have this, the mother must have been a carrier. So she looked unaffected because she had a good copy of it, but she gave that affected allele to 
her sons. She would also give it to her daughters, but as long as her um, husband did not have it, then they would not um, be impacted by it. Hemophilia is another example of this. Um, hemophilia throughout the European noble families, this was a problem because what would happen is in order to do political alliances, you would have cousins intermarrying, which like I told you, inbreeding is more likely to produce these traits because you're carrying the same recessive alleles. And that is an example of a sex-linked recessive trait. Um, and then moving on, um, we're going to go talk about polygenic um, inheritance. Poly, what does poly mean? Poly means many. So now it's not just I's or T's or A's that are giving you that trait, but a combination polygenic um, polygene. So in this case, it's A's and B's. And an example of a polygenic trait is your skin color, right? We're not just black or white. There's all, you know, you can see a bell-shaped curve in that. So in this case, big A, big A, big B, big B would give you a very dark. The other extreme, little A, little A, little B, little B would give you very light. And then you have this bell-shaped curve in between. So polygenic inheritance is defined as when one trait is governed by two or more sets of alleles, two or more sets of alleles. Now, let me just take a quick moment here to talk to you. This is different than multiple alleles, right? Multiple alleles means you could have T1, T2, T3, and little t. They're all about the T's, right? That's multiple alleles. This is polygenic. So I have T's and R's and Q's all contributing to that one trait. Um, another example of this would be your intelligence, right? You're not big S, big S, super smart, big S, little S, semi-smart, little S, little S, super stupid. There's This is a polygenic trait you're inher inherit. Um, polygenic traits for intelligence. You have you know, R's and T's and Q's all working for that singular um, phenotype. So here's skin color. You can see this bell-shaped curve as a result of that. Okay, and these are traits, if you look underneath environmental influences, these are traits controlled by polygenes are subjected to environmental influences, environmental influences. Think about your skin color, right? Is your skin color impacted by the environment, right? Tanning and things like that, that is very typical of that. Look at height, okay? So these you have women in white shirts and men, biological males in blue shirts, and they're lined up by their height. You can see this bell-shaped curve. We're not either tall or short. And do you think a person's height could be impacted by the environment? Absolutely, right? Good nutrition, maximizing your alleles and growth, you would be taller. Your growth could be stunted um, if you started smoking cigarettes when you're five years old or you weren't having good nutrition. All right, so that brings us too to this idea of nature versus nurture. Nature is what's in your DNA, what, what have your genes given you, and then nurture is how does your environment influence the ex expression of those genes. One example of that would be in um, coloring of Himalayan rabbits. Here is your normal Himalayan rabbit. They shave the back of the Himalayan rabbit and put an ice pack on it. I don't know for how long. And when the hair grew back, it grew back black. So that was its environment influencing the color of the um, of the hair. Now think about why would this be adaptive? If you're a Himalayan rabbit, your feet could be on cold snow, your ears are up there in the cold wind, your nose, you're breathing in that cold air. So you would want to have that part of your body, which was most cold, which is what they induced right here with this ice pack to be black because remember black is going to absorb all the wavelengths of light which could increase the heat in that area whereas white reflects it. You can also see this in the sex of certain reptiles are determined by the temperature of the nest that they are getting raised in. All right and clownfish you know, Nemo, right? Um, they can literally change their sex. So not just by temperature, um, but they can change their sex. So if a female fish is at the, as is most dominant. So when she dies, the most dominant male will change their sex to take her place. So there are multiple ways um, in order for this to be enacted. Um, as I said before, these type of traits or polygenic disorders like cleft lip, um, cleft lip and some forms of depression and allergies, these are all um, polygenic traits and they are very much influenced by their environment. All right. And I think I gave you everything for that. And then um, 
I want to give you this practice. Let me get out of your way here. This practice problem. A certain polygenic trait is controlled by three pairs of alleles. Big A versus little a, big B, little B, big C, little C. What are the two extreme genotypes for this trait? Pause if you would like to. Okay, because I'm going to give you your answer right here. Yes, this would be one extreme, and this would be your other extreme for this polygenic trait. All right. Now, um, another one I met, want to just tie in with sex linked. I should have mentioned this a little bit either earlier is fragile X. And this is when you get repeating copies of certain nucleotides. And when you have too many copies, it does make the X chromosome um, like it's going to a portion of it is going to fall off. It's one of the most common forms of mental retardation. Children are either hyperactive or autistic, delayed speech. Um, and their facial features are a little bit different, and it's just because it's repeating the CAG, CAG, all right? So that could be influenced too by um, whether you are a male or a female. Okay, our last topic that we're gonna talk about is linked genes. Now, I've already talked to you about independent assortment, right? So if you have, remember we were looking, if you're looking at uh, alleles that say A and B working together, and if the A's are on one homologous pair and the B's are on another homologous pair, you could get you know, in your gametes, big A, big B, right? Um, big A, little B, little A, little B. We looked at all those different combinations. Well, you're not going to get independent assortment if your alleles, right, the traits that you're looking at are on the same chromosome, right? Because wherever big Z is going, big S is going with it. So those are what are referred to as linked genes. So on your notes, linked genes are defined as all the genes on one chromosome form a link linkage group. All the genes on one form chromosome form a linkage group. And genes that are linked together tend to travel together to the same gamete, like hair color and eye color. Typically, dark-haired people have dark eyes and light-haired people have light eyes. And that is on the same um, because those hair color and eye color are on the same chromosome. Now, what could break that up where you have dark hair and let's say blue eyes? So what could break that up? Do you remember? It happens during prophase one of meiosis. Crossing over could break up those linkages. All right, so I have that on your notes. Crossing over prophase one is the only way that linkages are um, broken, that linkages are broken. So typically in this situation, if you had big A, big B on one chromosome and little a, little B on another chromosome, you would expect half the gametes to receive this big A, big B combination and half to receive um, little a, little b combination. But if there's been some crossing over, you're going to see that expressed. And those are called recombinants. And that gives you an idea of how close the number of recombinants you have is how close they are probably on that chromosome. So let me give you an example here. What do you think is going to link is going to get broken up more? A link between Z and G or R and G? Think about that. Okay, and I would say it's most likely between Z and G, you're gonna break up those that linkage because there's so many different places to break up that linkage between these two. Whereas you have a smaller amount of area to break up the linkage between R and G. All right, so um, you have all of that in your notes and that is the end. Um, for my students, we'll be going through several practice problems and I have a lot of those listed here. So if you just wanna download this um, presentation, it's down in the descriptor are the notes that go with this presentation and there's a link to this so you can do those practice problems if you would like to. And if you're one of my students, I'll see you in class.